share this um, share this with can i share this no yes you can so um we are now live but uh, yes let us share the link so i think i have already um uh, i think what you have done is that you've already shared that link that poster is going to turn into a live view okay yeah so that poster is going to turn into a live view i'm just going to double check that that's the case and i can see us already on let me just check yours on yours are you able to see yours um, not yet no <laughs> Okay, let me try, yeah. Uh. Let me try. Hello, everybody. In case you're here, just press like and comment. Uh, just okay. So, um, yeah. So it's okay. Let me. So what you can do is you can go to mental health at work. Great. Done. <laughs> okay, done. Yeah, I think yeah. A watch okay. party. Sharing a watch party. Perfect. Great. So thank you so much for being here today. Let me just do a quick intro before we get into your story. My name is Heitel Doshi. I'm an organizational psychologist. And on the 30th of March, uh, just a little bit post at the MCO, a lot of my friends were hounding me to say, Heitel, I think it is time that you focus not just on the on commercial stuff, but support the community with regards to mental health at the workplace. Everybody's going through a difficult time. And so that was the birth of this Facebook group, Mental Health at Work. And ever since then, we have had amazing, amazing people. I don't know how many interviews we've had already, but at least over 40 now. We've had amazing um, uh, professionals. We've had some celebrities. We've had some people who do some really crazy things like magic and skating. And we've also had everyday heroes just like you and I. Today we have uh, YB Kasturi, who I think if you're Malaysian, you definitely know her and the fight that she's fighting for. Uh, I was so glad to have been able to catch her because it's really not easy to catch a politician or at least someone who's in that space. So I reached out to her and I was like, hey, would you be keen to share your story and you know share a little bit about mental health at work as well? And she was so sweet. She was like, yes. And so here we are today. So um, YB. Why don't you start by telling us who you really are? <laughs> um, hi, Hetel, and uh, thank you so much for reaching out uh, to me. Actually, uh, it's a little bit of a fangirl moment at this point. I've been following the good work that you've done, uh, and really, uh, not all heroes wear capes. Uh, some of them uh, are uh, organizational psychologists like you. Uh, who reach out and tap you into my thing. No, seriously, seriously. It's, it's people like you who tap into uh, the unpopular topics, the, the taboo topics, the controversial topics, the topics that bring a lot of stigmatization, which is on mental health, uh, not just in Malaysia, but everywhere in the world. Uh, and I've been reading your work. And when you when you reached out to me, I was like, oh, my gosh, it's like, you know, it's Hetel reaching out to me. Like, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. So the pressure is actually on me. What, it, what is it that I can deliver today? Uh, so I don't disappoint you and disappoint the viewers who have tuned in at this point. Um, oh, the last thing that will happen, not to worry. <laughs> okay, so my name is Kasturi Patu. I'm um, uh, 41 this year. Yep. Uh, born in Ipoh, um, pretty much grew up all the way up to uh, my Form 6 uh, uh, education. Uh, I studied in Maine Convent. I went on to do my Form 6 in St. Michael's. Uh, I'm a graduate in microbiology from University of Malaya. Uh, yes, but then um, born into a political family meant that my sister and I uh, had been exposed to politics, to justice, or rather injustice, um, to abuse of power and corruption at a very young age. Uh, my mom and my dad both uh, were very also involved in politics. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so. They took us along, mom took us along for events and dad included us in, in little things. So we would join him during campaigning. Uh, and campaigning back then was very different from what it is now, which is very much social media campaigning. Uh, at that time, for those who know what campaigning was um, three decades ago, four decades ago even, I uh, would tell you that 
uh, you had to buy a lot of starch and then stick posters uh, back to back, put them in plastic covers and then clip them onto raffia strings and then tie them up, um, uh, you know, uh, as campaign material. So, oh, wow. yeah, so these were things that we would do. Uh, Mum would just be making pots and pots of starch and we had volunteers at our house who'd come and stick them together and posters and banners and paint. We would buy yards and yards of cloth uh, and paint them in the house and then, you know, put loops at the end of it to tie them around as banners. But now everything is designed uh, uh, using <laughs> and then sent to the printer and, and voila, you get this beautiful, very uh, um, um, <laughs> how do I say, very beautiful designs and you know, state yeah. of the art sort of uh, uh, colors and whatnot. So um, yeah, uh, that was, that's, that's basically uh, uh, the person that I am. Uh, I love art. Um, I I love history, um, and I like science a lot as well. But because we were um, exposed to politics at a younger age, then it was easier for me to relate. I would I would see um, injustices in front of my eyes and wonder why things like this are happening to some people and it's not happening to me. When I saw, when I used to follow my father during campaigns, and looked at the situation or the conditions of how certain families lived, like in Sungai Siput in the estates. I, would, I came home and I, I kept thinking, why is it that they live the way that they did and we live the way that we did in our day? So I already had from a very young age questions about um, uh, inequality, social justice. Um, and um, I grew up in a family where I have very strong women around me, my aunts, my mom, for example, um, my teachers when I was in school, uh, yeah, and party figures as well. So, yeah. Yeah. so those those contributed a lot to to the person I am today. Wow. Okay. So you didn't just fall into this. This was like this is like a DNA in you. Yeah. This is a, in a way. In a way. You're right. Yeah. You're right. And. Um, why did you choose to go into this field apart from a family-related uh, hand-passed-down kind of a phenomena? Why did you choose to do it and how does one become a politician? Um, I, I believe that I made this decision to be a part of uh, politics now and here in Malaysia because I did not want to be on the sidelines to watch things happen to move, to watch things move and progress before my eyes. I wanted to be part of it. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to bring change. Uh, and I felt that I I was in a position to make a difference. Uh, and even if if uh, I was faced with challenges, I was determined to overcome them. Um, it is, it's not easy at all, um, being female as well. Um, and um, I would say even a minority uh, in this country uh, to be able to prioritize issues to be to be raised, to be spoken about, to be addressed, to be given priority. Uh, so and that is why I, I said I'm going to be a part of this. Right. Yeah. And um, okay, uh, back to basics. The word politics, right? What does it actually mean? Wow. <laughs> um, to me, it means. Um, governing it's a check and balance uh, it is um, a body that is um, uh, elected by the people um, a government elected by the people to take care of the people and to look into the needs of the people to ensure that one is left behind to ensure that there is social justice for all equality and equal opportunities for all as well uh, that was what it was about it was about human rights it was about standing up for those who are voiceless. It was about standing up for the marginalized. Yeah, and and all this uh, attracted me a lot. Uh, I was. It was never about the money, and I always say this to young people as well, uh, and also young women leaders. Uh, if you think politics is an avenue for you to make money, uh, then this is the wrong profession for you. If you if you have if you know someone who has made money from politics then please uh, stay away from that person. That is a, the worst model of what a politician should be. 
this is not a trade or a job to make money. Uh, mm. Neither make a name for yourself intentionally. Uh, my, my father has a road uh, named after him. My late father has a road, road named after him in Penang. Uh, but that wasn't his ultimate goal. Uh, he did not aspire to join politics and be a politician or an MP or a state assembly person because he had a vision of one day that would be a road named after him. No. Uh, he saw injustices before his eyes and he wanted to be the person to voice out so that if you see one injustice happening in front of you, there would be many more countless injustices happening everywhere else, some mm. even worse than the ones that you have seen. And mm. I think he took it upon himself to be the person to say, no, uh, this will be the last of this sort of an injustice and me and the people I'm with in the party uh, will be the ones to fight to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Right. Okay. Well, well, thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's quite valuable to really deeply understand the word politics, actually, because <laughs> That, that meaning and the definition has obviously been lost uh, because, yeah, because of also the, the casual way that we use it, you know, oh, you're so political, blah, 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 that, that the connotation, you know, has kind of uh, maybe gone so far as to maybe have lost the essence of the meaning itself. I'm not sure. So yeah. I want to check in with you as well. How do you then become, so what is the progression with regards to becoming an MP? So you're currently an MP, right? Yes. How do you become an MP, a uh, member of parliament or, you know, what is it? like, you know, if you are in the army, there's like, okay, there's this stage, there's this stage, there's this. Is that the same in politics as well? Do you have stages that you go up or ranks that you go up? Well, yes and no. Um, there are, um, obviously, you need to uh, be a member of a political party. Mm -hmm. uh, I, have, I have been a member of the, the DAP, I would say, since I was born, uh, you know, and um, yeah. Uh, but then uh, there are also, as we have seen um, recently over the past 20 years, uh, we have seen sometimes uh, political parties reaching out for uh, people who they think would be valuable to the struggle, uh, to, their, um, to issues that they are championing, uh, people who have had uh, expertise uh, in certain subjects that would benefit all Malaysians, everyone. Uh, and political parties reach out to them to... Uh, consider them or rather um, groom them as well if they've seen some potential uh, for them to be considered uh, as a candidate. Uh, but what is important is to understand to when you pick a political party, you have to understand their manifesto, understand what they fight for uh, mm. and if it is uh, parallel to what you believe in, uh, then don't think twice, join, be a part of that political party and journey together uh, with your comrades in the party. Mm. Uh, journey with your friends in the party. Uh, volunteer uh, at events. Um, uh, you have to increase your own general knowledge. Take the trouble to read up on what is mm. happening in the country. Uh, take the trouble to read up about what's happening in the world. Um, open your mind. Uh, read read um, criticisms. Read mm. uh, uh, viewpoints that are not the same as yours, opposing viewpoints. You have to develop critical thinking, ability to uh, uh, analyze things and, you know, think about things in a critical way. Uh, any, any decision and every decision that you make must be a selfless one. You mm. must put the interest of the people, you must put the interest of justice, the interest of human rights, the interest of doing what is right ahead of everything and anything. That's important. Right, right. And then slowly from a member, then you become what? What do you yeah. become after a member? So you become really good and you, you you feel like, okay, this fight is for me. Then from a member, then what do you become? It's about leadership qualities as well. Okay. So any opportunity that you have uh, to shine, um, you know, don't, don't stop yourself. Um, take, um, uh, accept challenges, uh, prove your worth. If you aspire, if you've already had that, that dream, that aspiration, or uh, uh, you know, it's your lifelong ambition to be a politician, a member of parliament, or even a minister or prime minister one day, you have to work for it. Uh, you must have your vision of what you want to do, uh, yeah. and you must have a plan. And, right. uh, yeah. So in my case, um, while my father and my mother were both, they have instilled a lot of qualities I would say good qualities uh, in my sister and I, but mm -hmm. 
but it was indeed a, a journey. Politics a hundred years ago is not the same as politics today. We we have progressed so much from a time where women were never allowed to vote a hundred years ago. Uh, it's a violation today if women aren't allowed to vote. Uh, while it was okay to to abuse your partners, you know, hit your wives and kick your wife and punch your wife a hundred years ago because it was a social norm. It's illegal. It's a crime today to uh, um, abuse your partner. So things have changed and I have progressed as well uh, along with the times. But again, what's important is um, to never be shackled by um, um, what you only know. And, and that's dangerous uh, because when you're uh, uh, an elected rep, for example, you yeah. speak to everyone. Uh, you even speak for people you don't like. You you speak for people who have not voted for you. You even speak for people who criticize you openly. Mm. You still speak for them, and that's very right. important. Yeah. Right. And so, with regards to uh, this particular landscape, uh, which is the political landscape, right. uh, one of the most important things is to be able to rally, um, to take action for a particular cause. Right. Uh, would that be one of the most more important things? Um, yes, a campaign yeah. rather uh, of, uh, of creating an awareness um, yeah. about certain subjects. For example, um, 40 years ago, um, talking about the environment was only exclusive to a group of people who cared enough about the ozone layer, uh, uh, the, the hole in the ozone layer getting bigger. Uh, it wasn't so popular 40 years ago, but today everyone is talking about climate yeah. change. Right, right. There, a constant reminders to the government to make sure that children know about climate change and the environment uh, and how we need to start saving it now uh, yes. from a young age. Right. Um, yeah, decades ago, child marriages were something very normal. No one talked about it. Sex education in school was always treated as a very taboo sort of a subject. Uh, but today, there is a great pressure to include and make sure that the right uh, um, uh, version rather or, or the right syllabus on sex education on child marriages is uh, absorbed into the, the syllabus and the education system right. so it is an awareness and the, and the discussion and you have to create a platform open up discussion for everyone to take part in and then you know how much of work needs to be done on that subject right what is an example that you can share with us of a campaign that you uh, had to champion uh, what are three major things that you have realized about creating a campaign, a really, really rock solid campaign? Um, and maybe, maybe just share with us something that you know. I, I guess all of us would have heard about, but maybe we didn't even realize that there was so much that went on behind um, having that outcome. So, right. did, can you share an example of a campaign that you were part of uh, well, or led? Uh, so there are uh, three of, um, I would say, um, very strong human rights issues that uh, I've been advocating or speaking about. Uh, one would be the, to abolish the death penalty in Malaysia. The other is to end child marriages in Malaysia. And it, the other one would be on freedom of religion and belief, uh, which mm -hmm. I'm a part of different global movements uh, championing this, uh, namely the Parliamentarians for Global Action. Uh, the ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights and also the International Panel of Parliamentarians for the Freedom of Religion and Belief. But I want to focus on child marriages now. Uh, a few years ago when a few of us MPs started to speak about child marriages and to link that up with uh, sex education, uh, it was in Parliament we actually uh, were faced with uh, some male MPs and at that time from BN who snickered and giggled when we spoke about sex education. Uh, and it was an eye-opener for me that members of the House, the August House, and these are out of 30 million Malaysians, 222 MPs, and these are the kind of MPs who giggle when you talk about sex education. And I thought, oh boy, I have a long way to go to speak about this subject, uh, to give it the due importance uh, and to tie that up with child marriages as well. So I started to write about it. Uh, issue press statements about it, joint press statements with my fellow MPs. Uh, I used to um, subscribe to um, uh, movements, global movements to end child marriages and uh, 
as I started to write more about this, uh, I had some invitations to attend conferences, uh, some even through the parliament, some individually, where they reached out to me through my party uh, for me to be a part of international uh, conventions, conferences, uh, workshops on ending the cycle of violence against girls. And it was an eye opener to see how other MPs dealt with the um, most serious cases of child marriages in their countries, like in Bangladesh or India or even Africa, uh, countries in the uh, African region. Uh, so when I came back, I put that in my, my, my parliament speech. Uh, and then I started to link up with uh, civil society activists here in Malaysia. Uh, mm. and, uh, and we started to form uh, friendship, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, I mean, some of the more exciting times were even during the debate, particularly on the uh, bringing in the new act, Sexual Offences Against Children Bill, which was mm. actually presented by Wadi Hazan. I was actually communicating with uh, uh, now a good friend, uh, Fadlina Sidek from Abim, uh, on issues and questions to raise about this from her point of view, which were very good. Uh, and that's how I think um, campaigns also should be run. Uh, run look, pushing for a campaign doesn't mean you take to the streets. Uh, it can be done online. It can be done by keeping the discussion alive, raising it in parliament, even though it's difficult, uh, even though it's tough, even though it's sensitive, uh, but to be objective about the matter uh, and not give in to um, cultural uh, pressures or, or treating the issue like it's taboo and you can't talk about it. Uh, mm. The fact that the problem like child marriages in Malaysia means that we all need to start talking about it. Uh, you know, and, and decisions must be made in the best interest of the children. So that's one of the campaigns that uh, I've been, uh, we've been talking about. To speak to lawyers, oh. to, to, yeah. Um, right. Right. What is the hardest thing? What is the hardest thing about raising awareness from, sorry, what is the hardest thing from a taboo topic to raising awareness, to uh, rallying people, to then impacting policy. What is the hardest bit? Um, I I think in this case, uh, if you speak about the child marriage, um, um, it is it is also it is about the legal system in the country because we have Sharia laws and we have civil laws. Uh, and they um, are not often on the same page. Uh, and therefore, um, violations or crimes are not viewed in the same manner in both these laws. Uh, mm. And we have various Sharia enactments in the country. Even in Sabah and Sarawak, there is the native courts, uh, particularly in Sabah. So those were my, my, my challenges, actually, with uh, dealing with uh, very old laws that are based on, um, perhaps to some extent, cultural beliefs, uh, even religious beliefs. Uh, mm. While we respect um, these this, uh, uh, different courts, for example, Sharia courts, civil courts, and the native courts. But at the end of the day, we must be on the same page when you speak about the protection and the rights of the child. Um, mm. In this case, one of the harder things that I have to deal with is already an existing problem in the country, which is polarization amongst all of us. Where we, 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 or rather, in you know, decades and decades of government propaganda in the past, uh, which differentiates us as being Muslim and non-Muslim, or Malay or non-Malay, uh, etc. Uh, and and so that that sort of um, um, that becomes sometimes the basis of this sort of uh, um, it, it it creates a. Um, it's a vicious cycle because you try to speak about this issue with evidence-based data, empirical studies, etc., and then you find that you're sucked into the whole racial, religious uh, conversation again. Uh, and I found that to be very tricky. Uh, parliament answers uh, were given uh, two years back, a year and a half back, uh, on racial breakdown, religious breakdown, state breakdown, age breakdown of uh, child just in the country and that brought a lot of discussion but it's funny because the minute it came out there were a lot of negative views on it but those views are now slowly becoming positive views because sometimes you don't need a politician to push for these sort of um, movements or rather rallies uh, but then 
uh, with the help of civil society, with the help of the general public, your neighbors, to bring this topic up in the coffee shop, uh, mm. to share that in uh, gives a, a different uh, view of things. Uh, it doesn't look like it's a political agenda. Sometimes when politicians push for something, mm. it looks like it's a political mm. agenda. And if, if many Malaysians tend to be apolitical, they say, no, I don't want to be seen to be supporting or opposing. But when civil societies bring it up, it's different. You know, like if women's organization comes forward and says, you know, the government must do something to end child abuse, it's, it's, it gives a different perspective to it rather than an MP from the opposition saying it or an MP from the government saying it. Mm. Uh, the skeptics out there or rather the idealists out there might say, oh, there's a government agenda behind it. Right. So, yeah. so this, is, this is really interesting because um, your turning point, your turning point basically came back down to science, evidence-based scientific data that you yeah. put through, but also the voice of the public. Yes, yes. So, so what ultimately makes the biggest difference when it comes to policy? Is it ultimately then... Uh, the influencing power of an MP, uh, MP the, the intelligence of the MP itself, it, is it that or is it ultimately back down to science and getting people to back it up? Uh, I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all solution or answer for this. Uh, I think you need experts uh, who uh, know of this matter, people, uh, those who have experience in it, uh, who have done a lot of research or study on it, uh, mm. And when I say that, I also mean unbiased research and study on it. Uh, and, um, they, they are the ones who often come forward okay. and uh, share their views as well. Yeah. So this is amazing. This is really amazing. Because this is the part that excites me the most when it comes to experts and research. Because when I try to get data around a lot of things in Malaysia, especially in the space of mental health, I cannot for the life of me know where the data is number one that already i have to search like crazy number two i don't know how the data was collected number right. three because i don't know that i don't know whether i can trust the data and number four i don't even know whether i can contribute to say that hey you know uh, although we are a corporate entity or whatever it is can we help you or not like if we can see that there's a gap yeah. can we help you or not like for free okay it doesn't matter like but can we just help uh, that also we don't know where to go. So what you're trying to say is that the major way change can take place is obviously uh, it, it differs, it differs. But ultimately, you need to have expertise, you need to have data, and you need to rally yeah. people around it. So where yeah. is this space? Where is this space for research? Um, and and how, yeah. how, how well do you think we are doing in this space of uh, partnering with experts, getting research done? How well do you think we as a country are doing in Malaysia? Um, I think uh, there's a lot of room for improvement um, uh, and uh, I can also understand why sometimes academicians feel um, burnt out at the end of the day because their proposals, their uh, suggestions, their advice uh, which, is, which is given to the government um, is, has nothing to do, it, it's, it's not about their personal interests or their personal agenda or to put forward their study or what they've been working on. But only because what they've been working on will benefit the greater on the larger public, you know. Uh, and many times we find that there's a culture of not wanting to subscribe to what experts have to tell us uh, and what uh, uh, academicians have to, to tell us and what research, people who are doing research, uh, researchers have, uh, uh, telling us. Um, I think I, I have actually seen a change uh, from not just from 2008, but there have been change uh, from 2008, like for example in Penang, uh, Penang Institute, which acts as a think tank uh, that conducts studies and research and invites experts to come and speak on uh, many different topics uh, from history to economy to social justice to uh, um, crime, etc. To, to to reach out and connect with people who have that sort of an interest or who have not found their niche to contribute. And now Penang Institute have a pool of many, many Penangites who come forward to share their knowledge and their expertise. That's with awesome. Them. Yeah. Uh, and 
often the state government of Penang also uh, looks into recommendations by Penang Institute and even in Parliament for that matter. Uh, uh, I use a lot of the studies done by Penang Institute uh, in my speeches, in my debates, uh, etc. And particularly, I must uh, commend uh, the speaker, uh, Dato Arif, because after 2018, we have finally seen select committees, six select committees that had been set up uh, in Parliament. Uh, mm. We had never seen that before. In the past, they were all ad hoc select committees, standing committees for election. We had one on liners, etc. Uh, in the past, but this time we have a special select committees in Parliament, functioning mm. select committees. Sorry, uh, what does that mean? Pardon my ignorance. Oh no. Uh, so in in a for a Parliament or rather the, for the August House to to function. Um, how do I say, in the best possible way that it can. Uh, not all issues and all topics can be asked in the office house, in the day one record, to be addressed in detail, in great detail. And that's why select committees are set up in the parliament uh, on certain and various subjects. For example, um, in other countries, like if you follow the Westminster system in UK, there are so many select committees, one on maybe... Um, um, on, on gender issues, one on rights of child or children, uh, you have on, on health, on transportation, on corruption, for, for example. And these select committees consist of MPs from both sides, uh, the independent, the, the opposition and government MPs, uh, who have been talking about the subject or who have an interest or knowledge in it, to sit in these select committees. And these select committees actually have investigative powers which means, for example, if you have a select committee on statelessness or citizenship issues, then the select committee is given power to summon uh, the uh, head of the National Registration Department to question or to dialogue with the director. Why, why do we have so much a backlog of citizenship applications? What about foreign spouses? What about children from orphanages? What about babies who are, uh, uh, you know, um, who have no parents? Oh. Or yeah, so we have investigative powers, we have power to summon, uh, even ministers have been summoned in the past in UK, uh, ministers have actually been summoned uh, to the select committee and normally the chairman is uh, a member of parliament from the ruling government. Uh, right. Yes, and um, um, and you, you ask questions, you can, you know, uh, who advised you to make this decision, let's say on, on any, any policy for that matter. And the minister has to answer. He must come and he must answer. Uh, right. and, all, and all of this is minuted and, and, and the report is submitted to parliament. Uh, and if it's, if it's urgent, if it is of national interest, uh, public interest, it will be uh, uh, a paper uh, to be presented in parliament, a motion, and it may be even debated in parliament. Apart from that, we set up what you call the all-party parliamentary group. Now, why I'm mentioning this is uh, there are MPs amongst us who have been speaking about mental health awareness in Parliament, looking at budgets, uh, national budgets under the Ministry of Health for mental health, uh, looking at you know how how can we tap, how can we utilize this budget, how have we used it in the past, and etc. Um, there is no select committee yet on mental health awareness, but there is an initiative by MPs to set up a all-party parliamentary group. So this is like a caucus where not just MPs sit in, but experts as well uh, yeah. who can come to parliament, sit in a caucus and discuss about uh, mental health awareness. And these recommendations or suggestions will therefore go through the speaker and perhaps presented either directly to the minister or right. can be presented to a select committee that has the interest of health care or, or mental health for that matter, for it to be then submitted to parliament. Right. So we were in the process of actually setting that up. Uh, I had a meeting with my fellow MPs, uh, um, with the speaker on this, uh, Dr. Kelvin Yee, the MP for um, Banda Kuching, uh, was actually very keen on it. He was spearheading this. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, and we were supposed to be discussing it in the coming sitting in March this year mm -hmm. <laughs> to see how we can rope in more people, experts, psychologists, you know, like yourself even, um, you know, to, to come in and, um, you know, to be a part of the Bar Council, for example, to come in and be a part of this. Mm. Um, so it's like, in some cases, uh, it is not to say that 
Um, many cooks spoil the soup, but because you have different entities. Yes, uh, absolutely. When you set up these sort of bodies within the parliament, it also ensures that uh, important issues don't fall through the cracks. Yes, absolutely. You know, it is always sometimes the same MPs who are talking about certain issues. Mm. Uh, if you about mental health, you will see the same faces talking about it, raising and agreeing with each other, disagreeing, debating. If you speak about death penalty, you will see the same faces. But we want more MPs, more MPs should start speaking about uh, issues because these are issues that affect everyone. Absolutely. Every every single constituency of the 222 have people suffering with mental health uh, yeah. on different levels. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, everyone has a role to speak up about it. Mm. So this, this Actually, is I have no idea that you had so much awareness about this. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because, well, I must also say that um, because um, I have uh, this, the second bridge of Penang uh, links from the mainland to my constituency mm -hmm. and it is a hot spot for attempted suicides and suicides. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. And I'm, yeah, and I'm also very, um, I would count my, I'm say, I would say I'm blessed because uh, an NGO called uh, Pratubuhan Sneha Malaysia, which gives counselling particularly in Tamil, uh, Malay and English, uh, uh, their office is based in my constituency as well. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's headed by Dr. Florence Sinea, who is also a director in Penang Business Development Corporation. Um, and there's always a discussion about mental health. When you have someone mm. for it to yeah. speak to general, a, a larger group, they will always remind you on the importance of talking about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so that's why um, I always keep this issue um, alive and even to, to, to raise it, not even in parliament, but sometimes behind closed doors with ministers to tell them, can you push for, for, for some reform to decriminalize suicide uh, you know, and, and things like that. Yeah. Mm, right. Um, wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you have far from disappointed. You have far from I'm like, oh my God, okay, now I really need to talk to you about so many things. But um, yeah, no, definitely mental health is, um, as you would know, I think in 2017, there was uh, reports that had come out already that I think one in three or one in four was going through mental health related issues. Uh, we've also had WHO that has said that this is the number one, the number one cause of diseases already. So mental health related issues are the cause of, or the leading cause of diseases already. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to put it out there that, you know, uh, we tend to have mental health related issues before we begin to show symptoms of physical related issues that's for sure yes. uh, but yeah i'm just so glad that people are beginning to talk about it and i'm so glad that there are people like you out there who are kind of pushing for it as well that's just wonderful to hear that's just really 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 wonderful to hear we so i have people sorry like inspire us we do it because we have people like y'all who inspire us oh, and yeah, wow. you know not, not just you, Hita, but others out there who are checking up on MPs to see if these issues are raised or not. And that's what we yeah. need. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And also, I guess for me, it's more, yeah, for me, it's also, uh, you know, that the fact that it exists with functioning people, uh, just like you and I, you know, on the outside, we look like we're okay. It's not just, I'm not just talking about the clinical issues. I think that's a very old idea already. That, yeah, right. but that's a small minority, definitely, that I really need major treatment. But the rest of the majority also yeah. have what we call highly functioning uh, depression or highly functioning uh, anxiety. You, you know what I mean? Like it's, So that needs to be, I think, also addressed. But that's not for discussion today. Today is about <laughs> you. Today is about you. And I wanted to also um, ask you, what was... What was the day in your life that just made everything worth it? Like all the stress, all the job, like what was that day that just made like everything like, okay, yeah, this is why I'm fighting. This is, this day is exactly why I'm fighting for the things that I'm fighting for. What was that day for you? Um, I think it would be the day that I was uh, sworn in um, as the MP for Batukawan at the swearing in ceremony. Um, yeah, it was it was something um, to be standing there to represent uh, my voters, uh, to represent Batukawan, to represent 
uh, women to represent my community. Wow, it was just, yeah. And I felt like, like, you know, Kula, am I amongst all this, you know, like coming to parliament at that time in 2013, um, in July for the swearing in ceremony uh, to see uh, MPs, other most senior MPs and, you know, to feel, wow, you know, I'm, I'm actually here. And this is, of, of the 30 million people, you know, we are the 222 selected to come to speak what is right, to speak for people, to give voice for them. I think that, that was that was it for me. Plus, I shaved my head in May as a sign of protest in the election campaign. Wow. But, yeah, with, with that, yeah, I should have thought about it when I May. <laughs> I went in July with short hair, but then, yeah, it was it was certainly worth worth um, worth it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Hatia's congratulations. Being female, being a minority, being super young as well. Uh, you know, I'm just <laughs> well, but, come on. I mean, you know, we've had a little bit of a different standard this time with uh, Tun Mahathir coming on. So yeah, you know, if if that's if that's prime time, then yeah, you're absolutely super young. So yeah. also to check in with you, what was the toughest day? What was the day where um because in this in this Facebook group we've asked we've had a lot of polls done, so people kind of just share their opinions. Every time we run a poll, people have dichotomous point of view. But there's one poll where everybody had the same view. And that poll was, or the question of that poll was, have you ever felt like you were drowning? Have you ever felt that experience before? And everybody said yes. And oh, I think yeah. that's that's human beings, right? Like that's that one single thing that all of us can agree on that we all have those days. So oh, can yeah. you, yeah, would you, and I'm sure for you, there's loads. Yeah. Yeah. What was what was really the hardest though? The one that took really a long time to kind of come out of or even until today, maybe you're like, whoa, that was really, really hard. What was probably the hardest time for you? Maybe personally or professionally, it doesn't matter. Personally, um, was uh, losing my father uh, when I was uh, 16. I was actually two weeks shy of, of uh, turning 16. Uh, and um, even though my, my late father would, is someone that uh, everyone speaks about in a very high manner, you know, a firebrand, fiery orator, um, a real, a true freedom fighter. Uh, you know, and uh, I have seen my father stand uh, in a coffee shop uh, in Goping, in Kopisan, you know, on the on the table in a coffee shop to address a crowd of uh, uh, his Chinese voters in the Chinese village, and he he spoke to them and reached out to them. I have seen pictures of him attending human rights events conferences in Geneva, and, and this that was the kind of person he was. He was so diverse, uh, and uh, uh, even when he didn't spend much time at home because he was just so busy with his work, um, but he. The time spent was really, really very valuable, and uh, I, I learned so much about principles and policies and uh, politics, even um, just by the little that I've experienced with him. But more of what I've heard about him and read his press statements, I've heard his speeches, his video recordings, and and it was truly inspiring. And uh, to lose him at that age for me was very, very, very hard. Because I was very close to dad, and my sister was um, 14 at that time. I mean, this is the age where it was just, and we were moving to Penang because he just won the election. In, he's an MP for Bagan in Penang, and we were in the midst of shifting. Mm. So, um, and I'm the eldest in the family, so I really had to, at that very moment, say that, uh, you know, I have to, you know. Put, put a little bit of my grief aside for a while and then just you know call up the movers and tell them okay that passed away when can you bring the stuff back and they were like what and crying and sobbing on the phone i was like okay so let me know and uh, yeah so at that age i think um, it's wow. yeah. yeah so it is it is sad um during the 2013 campaign, uh, when I went, I was a new face in the uh, and I had people who were asking me, so can you speak like your father? Can you talk like your father? And I was, so after a few days into the campaign, I was actually feeling really down, like, I can't speak like that, you know, like, like, 
you know, he was really one of a kind. And it really dawned on to me, like, who can speak like him? Nobody can speak like him, not even me. So the next time when I went campaigning in a day or two, where people asked me, so can you speak like your father? I asked them, who can speak like my father? They said, no one can speak like him. Oh, said, you know, that's a really great response. No one can speak like him. Who can speak like him? I said, can anybody mm. speak like Harpal Singh? No. You may sound like Gobin or Ram or Jagdeep may sound like him, but no one can speak like Harpal. And no one can speak like him too. So, yeah. And they said, yeah, you're right. But it's big shoes to fill. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge shoes. And hopefully you don't even bother trying to fill those shoes in and you just <laughs> enjoy the shoes that you are wearing, right? Because it's hard. That's but, uh, the best to be wearing. Keeps me in check. Really yeah, it reminds me of uh, the struggle. Uh, it reminds me that whatever he fought for before is still very relevant today. Yeah. Uh, so it is true that the seeds that he planted uh, has grown uh, into this tree that is, is giving us this shade, you know, um, protecting the guiding us and taking care. Yeah, so I look at it that way. Beautifully said. That's beautifully said. Hey, I just forgot a couple of our viewers. Oliver Woods is saying hello. Great interview, Shabas YB. Uh, Pirumal Ramasamy is saying wonderful interview. Chelsea Gemma is saying hello, watching from Italy. Um, so yeah. So um, I just wanted to ask you maybe uh, one or two last questions before we 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 draw up, draw our time up for the day. But I, I thought I had to ask you this question. How do you deal with the fight? Like, there is just so much of fighting. <laughs> there is you fighting for something, and then there's you trying to fight for something else, and then there are people fighting with you, and there are people fighting against each other, and there's just fight, 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 fight. There's just so much. <laughs> um, just even as, uh, you know, a, a civilian just watching it is already like, whoa, this is. I know. How do you, how do you, what's your fix? How do you fix it? How do you fix it for yourself? <laughs> uh, I learned how to pick my battles. Uh, over the years, I've sort of uh, told myself that I'm uh, going to be a bit smart about how I want to um, uh, take on these challenges, etc. Uh, and um, uh, I used to be, my first few months in parliament used to be very reactionary. Uh, I react to everything that's said, every comment that's said, that would be like, who said that, you know, that kind of thing. But over time, you kind of realize that, you know, is, is, this, is this character worth addressing? No. Uh, what's important is for you to, 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 to make sure that your message is loud and clear here. Uh, so, yeah, over time, you pick your battles, you learn how to ignore, but when you need to speak up for yourself, you must, um, uh, you know, Politics is also still very male dominated, uh, and uh, I find that that you know we all have a long way to go. Uh, but yeah, so in in that aspect, yeah, I uh, you ignore. Sometimes you ignore. You find uh, again. You pick your battles. Yeah. What what helps you when you need to uh, fight for something on the spot? Because um, I'm, I'm not sure how you how used to are you at it, but but like I think I don't know for me personally and for a lot of people that I've heard as well, you know when you're fighting or having an argument or a debate, uh, yeah. sometimes you're trying to you kind of catch up with it later. You're like, oh, I should have said it then, or I should have said yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it happens to you as well. <laughs> in the more more in the beginning stages, uh, but I'm a bit more um, composed I think now in Parliament. Uh, and diplomatic in a way. Um, uh, sometimes you don't want your issue to be drowned by a shouting match, uh, and uh, therefore it will defeat the entire purpose of raising the issue, the point. So it is to uh, to ensure that you you put those points across um, clearly, uh, and then if you need to counter, then uh, don't be afraid. I've I've sometimes when I find that. Um, when I'm dealing with the uh, intimidating male MPs, especially from the other side, um, I, I, because it comes naturally, <laughs> uh, you know, I just sometimes I cannot brain how you can argue with this point, you know, and then you can just try to clean tongue in the day one racket, like please, you know, <laughs> dude, like 
know, there's so many of us here and you're trying to pull a fast one on us. Yeah, so sometimes yeah. you actually put them in their place uh, and tell them off. Yeah. Right. It's important to know your rights and where you stand. If you know your right and you're true, uh, uh, yeah, then don't back down on that. What yeah. are you scared about? Sorry? What do, you, what do you still get scared about? Um, what still scares you sometimes? Sometimes you don't have to say this is this is not a good place to say it. Okay, <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Uh, I can be quite impulsive sometimes, so that's that can be a little bit uh, tricky. What do you mean by that? Um, I sometimes react and say things uh, uh, on social media, you know, and then I say, "Oh, I probably shouldn't have said that." <laughs> It's such yeah. a fine line, though. It's such a fine line. Is who who knows how to how to actually uh, where that line is drawn. Today the line could look like it's ninety eight degrees. Tomorrow the line could look like it's fifty yeah. degrees. Yep. Yeah. So it just depends on how you woke up that day and how you interpret it as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, True. And I guess maybe the last one to to kind of uh, to kind of conclude it. What is an advice? Sorry. Just give me one minute. I for some reason my my. Uh, even though my, my my laptop is charging, but my battery seems to be draining. Okay. Um, yeah, just uh, how do I... Hang on a minute. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what do you want me to do? What do you need me to do? I'm ah, so ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, sure. No worries, no worries, no worries. Thank you. Hello, everybody who's still here. Hopefully you are here and I'm not talking to myself, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and I'll try to get a bit of time with uh, YB. Uh, but otherwise, it'd be awesome to have her here again and share a little bit more, I guess, about how to deal with intimidation because um, that can be very intimidating as well. In the meantime, we'll just give her a couple of minutes to um, get plugged, literally get plugged. Okay, and we are back. Hello. <laughs> so so much fresher now. Look, everything is so much brighter now. So I guess maybe, maybe just to conclude for the day, um, is there an advice that you have received or an advice that you want to give that, that you think is like super powerful? So maybe just something to leave us with. Wow. Um, there are a few, but I'd like to go by this one by Edmund Burke. Uh, is for, um, for evil to triumph is when good men do nothing. Uh, and uh, I'd like to change that to when good men and good women uh, do nothing. Um, I think everyone is born with a conscience. And when you see something wrong that's happening in front of you, when you see injustices, when you see something not right, and it pricks your conscience, you have to voice out about it. You have to state your opinion about it and state your stand. Um, I, I believe that all of us, every one of us have a role to play uh, to bring about the change that we wish to see. Uh, and it cannot be a one person championing or two yeah. people championing or the same people championing. Uh, we need every single person to be a part of it. Uh, so in this case, um, I, I, I feel that as Malaysians, we are in this situation that we are today is because many Malaysians in the past sorry, um, thought that they couldn't bring about certain changes, they didn't want to go against any system. Um, you know, many, many pools of groups of Malaysians were in their comfort zone, they didn't want to rock the boat, they didn't want to change the system. They weren't, they weren't happy with what was happening, but they thought that uh, it's still better than if it's worse than what it is now. And that just allowed uh, so much of um, uh, racism and religious bigotry, sexism, misogyny uh, that continued to uh, uh, grow in our society to a point that it became so big that uh, it, it, it is now taking so much uh, effort from all different parties to fight against. Um, yeah. But 
I was talking to a reporter today and he was asking me, he said, do you think there's hope for the country? I said, definitely, absolutely, a million percent. I just, I, I just don't think it's going to happen right now or maybe next year or the year after. But I have great hope in good Malaysians. I have great hope in patriotic, peace-loving Malaysians uh, who will come forward, who will be the greater voice against the, the voice of the, the bigots and the racists and uh, the xenophobes and, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the sexists. Uh, yeah, so I, I think there will be a time. Uh, I believe that, you know, we, we need to have other countries to look, uh, you know, uh, um, I would not, yeah, role model countries is a strong word, but there are many countries with a lot of very good success stories of how uh, their community or society live in a very cohesive uh, environment. And I think it is important to learn from these countries and these societies yeah. how we could do the same. Um, today, if a person stands in New Zealand to talk about, uh, you know, to propagate racism and propagate uh, 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 what they believe, uh, um, which is very right-wing sort of conservative ideologies, you would see the greater New Zealand community or the people going against that. And that yeah. is important. It is yeah. the middle, it is the middle ground. It is the, the voice of reason that is right in the middle that mm. cannot be anymore mustn't be silenced and mustn't allow themselves to be silenced in every country that you see it is always the racists and the xenophobes and the bigots who have the louder voice but it is up to us to make sure that we silence them it is not always on the government uh, to do you know it is the people at large we have yeah. to be accountable and take charge as well if you yeah. if someone goes on twitter and says it's okay to punch your wife man i mean you married her you know and and if it's not for you, she won't get the title of wife. It, you, you, you have everyone has to collectively stand up against that sort of an idea. Yeah. And yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and to let the person who who said that made that statement know that it is wrong on yeah. all levels. Yeah. Do you think but, Malaysians are doing a really good job at that today. Uh, yes, but then sometimes there's a danger of when fake news uh, is propagated as well. Malaysians also sadly tend to react to that fake news um mm. yeah as uh, we have seen um, in the past few weeks especially particularly uh, very xenophobic uh, comments made against um, foreign workers and it's so strange because expatriates are also foreign workers in the country but they, yeah it's just that when expatriates enter the country there is a limousine waiting for them at the airport their house is already ready for them uh, to live in. Their hotels are booked for them to live in. Uh, they have a chauffeur the very next day to bring them to their organization or office or where they're supposed to serve or in a university. But foreign labor, um, uh, like migrant workers, uh, come packed <laughs> in a plane, not knowing the language, nothing about the country, uh, brought in by agents, uh, stuffed into... Uh, hostels and homes. Um, yeah, so there's a great difference in how we view um, uh, migrant yeah. workers. Yeah. yeah. A person uh, from know, Europe yeah. is also a migrant worker. Yeah, I think what you're trying to say is that there is a lot of reaction from uh, the civil society, which is a good thing these days, yes. but there's also yes. a reaction to fake news. So I think the, mi the yes. middle part needs to be validate first before reacting to certain exactly. things, but definitely react when need be. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, yesterday someone sent me a video of what looked like uh, foreign uh, migrant workers uh, attacking police force, uh, throwing stones at them, and and what was heard like gunshots, you know, uh, and and the caption was this happened in Selayang, and today it came out uh, that this actually was a, a scene that happened in Indonesia, um, and whether it was migrant workers versus the authorities or were, were they locals versus the authorities, I don't know. But what is evident is this, for a fact, it didn't happen in Selaya, it never took place in Malaysia, uh, and it happened in Indonesia. Right. Um, and this was actually spread through many WhatsApp groups that why should we give uh, face to any to migrant workers? Because look at how they react to our authorities. Um, and this just happened in Selaya and that sort of thing. Okay, so it, all right. Yesterday. So if you were the Prime Minister, I'm not saying of Malaysia, but 
I guess we can assume that, but let's you know, make sure that we don't get into any trouble for anything. I'm just saying that if you were the prime minister, just like a general question, yeah, I really hope I don't get into trouble for this. What is one of the first things that you would do? Wow. Um, at this moment, or if it is an I, ideal situation without COVID-19? Um, I guess in this situation. Wow. Um, I think for a start, and very importantly, is to allow parliament to convene for two weeks. Mm. As the prime minister, the onus is on me to ensure that there is check and balance uh, on decisions that are made. Today, ministers are making statements, decisions are made, announcements are made without any check and balance um, uh, on how these decisions came about, uh, you know, and, and questions that are asked, you know, every. The Prime Minister makes an announcement, the Finance Minister makes an announcement, Bank Negara Malaysia makes an announcement, Defence Minister makes an announcement, Home Minister makes an announcement. Yes, but then the only people right now directly asking them questions are reporters who are there to ask them questions. But MPs, you know, we, we need to find out about how these decisions were made, uh, how and what's going to happen in the future. What is the monetary implication when this decision uh, is uh, executed? And today, if we're going to speak about health and economy, which is by far the two most important things that we're going to speak about uh, uh, during COVID and post-COVID, uh, there are a lot of legislative questions that need to be addressed, uh, whether we're going to be amending our acts, our laws, uh, coming up with new policies. Um, yeah. These are important issues for select committees to study. Uh, and even as Lim Kitsang, um, Mr. Lim Kitsang has been pushing for a special select committee in parliament to talk about COVID-19. He's been just issuing statements every single day to remind the government why you are there. As government, you must call for parliament to convene. Yes, mm -hmm. the 18th of May parliament sitting is just to fulfill uh, a requirement or a, a, a you know, cukup syarat according to the federal constitution that parliament must convene in six months. But now that you yeah. have summoned all your 222 MPs to come to KL, to be in Parliament, to listen to the royal address of our King, then you can continue to extend it for another two weeks. So we can speak about important issues for mm. the people. Because mm. the next norm will be something will maybe for another year or two or three. It yeah. would, it's life-changing for everyone. Yeah. It's life-changing life for policy makers. Right. Today, people in my constituency asking me, you know, um, uh, I'm still employed, but I don't get a salary. What am I going to do? How mm -hmm. do I address sort of employment issues? These are matters to bring up to Parliament. Yeah. On, on, you have to protect employees as much as you have to protect employers. You know, neither one can survive without the other. Oh, so what I is the difference? Yeah. And with that, the burnout. I was talking to police officers. Uh, you know, who are our frontliners. I went to clinics uh, uh, in my constituency and speaking to medical personnel about burnout. You know, at some point, our frontliners are going to be burnout. In fact, that point has come even now. I think yeah. many of them are already feeling, you know, the, the their, what is the state of their mental health? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. In Parliament, domestic violence, how will education be? Yes, you say you have a, a program out for uh, uh, virtual classes, but then when you have single parents who need to work, who's going to be there to coach your child at home? And if that is the case, what about cases of those living in in B forty uh, uh, socio economic uh, uh, categories or yeah. rather socio economic conditions? Yeah. They have no. I guess what you're to say, I guess what you're trying to say is that if you were the prime minister at this point, oh. not necessarily of Malaysia. Uh, you would just definitely want to have more debate and you definitely want to have a lot more intellectual uh, opinion coming in and push for the right and best thing that can be done for the people. And that's, what, that's what you're trying to say. Well, we have, we have, yeah, absolutely. Well, we wish you all the very best for what's coming up and what will come up even after that uh, and for every day in between because... Uh, you know, living in a world or living in a space in your world where you constantly have to advocate, you constantly have to fight. It's not easy. So we wish you all the very best to find thank a good one. So <laughs> thank you. And I'd like to use this opportunity to thank you, Hetel, for what you're doing. I'm sure you have 
your team uh, uh, behind you. You know, a good leader is only as good as a team. Uh, and, um, you know, for the good work that you're doing to speak about uh, mental health awareness and how important it is to keep the conversation going, no more pushing it in the in the background and showing it into a dark space. Oh, it's taboo, you know, we shouldn't talk about it. Yeah. Um, and also to the frontliners, um, I think it is it is good people like you who are going to come in now uh, to support frontliners who are feeling the burn, who are going through this uh, period of um, you know Absolutely. fatigue and exhaustion physical and mental as well yeah uh, well thank you thank, thank you, you so much. thank you so much for that we're not doing enough we're definitely doing something <laughs> but we're not doing enough and i'm sure it yeah. takes a, a whole the whole world to really uh, rally behind mental health because right. hey, right. this is obviously yeah. the most important thing in the world right you don't have this right. you have absolutely nothing um so thank you so much for everything that you've done please feel free to reach out if you need any help at all but we'll absolutely yeah. stay in touch thank take you care. so much take care thank you. and you too thanks you too.